Hello, my fellow Tamarielites. Welcome to the channel, or welcome back. Hey, I don't know if you heard, but Gold Road dropped. Before that happened, I put out part one of a lore series about Athelia, and let me tell you, the urge to shout spoilers from the rooftops was almost overwhelming. But I made my willpower rolls, got through it without ruining anything, and I promised you there'd be more later. Guess what? It's later. So grab a drink, maybe a spoonful of moon sugar if you're partial, and let's do a lore dive. First, the spoiler list. This video is going to cover plot details from the Gold Road Zone story, and of course, the plots from the Necrom Zone story and both Necrom and Gold Road prologue quests. I will be trying to repeat as little of the material from part one of this series as possible, so if you haven't seen that video, it's a good idea to go watch it first. I'll put a card on the screen with the link. Now then, Gold Road. When last we were questing, it was the Gold Road prologue, which ended with us discovering Athelia escaped the prison that Hermaeus Mora trapped her in so many millennia ago. Athelia's scion, Torvasar, just about broke himself to get her out and was somewhat distraught when he discovered she was free but hadn't reached out to him. I did not forget my friends! It turns out, however, that being imprisoned for thousands of years is detrimental to one's mental health. I know, go figure. So Athelia, once released, barely remembered her own name, let alone Torvasard's. We asked him where she could have gone, and he figured out the answer as he talked to us, but naturally didn't share his insight, being as how we're enemies at all. However, the point was made that she would return to places that feel familiar and comforting to her. At the beginning of the Gold Road Zone story, Laramil tracks us down to say that no, she still doesn't know where Athelia is, but she does see threads of fate fraying all over Westfield, and she guesses those are Athelia's footprints. She therefore asks us to investigate the sites where fate has gone all wonky, in hopes of finding our missing goddess. Laramil's request sends us, in no particular order, to Rustwall, an Imperial Colovian estate where we meet Westweald's Legion Tribune Alia and get an overview of politics in the region, Ostamir, a damaged settlement where we see the impacts of the Dawnwood on Westweald, and Ellenglen, an Aeliad ruin. Between them, it's a nice tour of Westweald's three biomes. At Rustwall and Ostamir, our investigation reveals Daedric forces and cultists, the Recollection, are active in the area but are hidden underground. Ellenglen is an abandoned alien ruin, so the Recollection there are just swarming around unhidden. The Recollection is a new cult in the region mostly composed of Bosmer who believe they are descended from aliens, and therefore the rightful heirs of the territory of Westweald, which is filled with the ruins of alien strongholds. The core of all this is, of course, Athelia. It's important to remember that although Athelia is confused at this point in the story, the cultists are still being influenced by her. Athelia isn't only seeking some place that's familiar and comforting, she's starved for worship, for the attention of mortals. On some level, she wants to return to a shrine full of alien devotees who welcome her home and tend to her. In turn, the recollection are being subconsciously driven to be at those places to do that, and that drive fuels their ambition to retake the lands, the ruins, and the shrines of their Daedric prince. Also in the mix are the side effects of Mora's forgetting spell. We've seen several instances where a particular person was driven nearly mad by the sudden lack of memories, like that cipher in Cipher's Midden. So I believe part of the zealotry in the recollection comes from that sense of violation of being made to forget such a cornerstone of their culture. There's more to say about the recollection, but I'll be covering them in a future lore video in this series, so I'll leave it there for now. In addition to running into all kinds of recollection forces while investigating Ellinglen, we also meet someone else for the first time, but I'll come back to that in a bit. Overall, our investigations at the three sites of Rustwall, Ostomir, and Ellinglen reveal that in order to retake Aeliad land, recollection leaders are working with Daedric forces to create a spell similar to the green-speaking spells used by the Bosmer to sculpt their homes. Except this is a weaponized, aggressive version of that spellcraft, corrupted with Daedric power. This new spell created both the Dawnwood and the Rim of Wildburn that precedes it. The Daedric forces helping the Recollection are, of course, Athelia's Daedra, the Shardborn, led by Shard Marshal Vargas. To grow the Dawnwood forest, the Shardborn and the Recollection planted seeds, called Wildburn seeds, that sprout into an unnatural and ravenous plant growth trying to eat Westweald. The growth of the Dawnwood has two purposes. It destroys Imperial settlements, as we saw in Ostomir, but it also returns the region to the lush forests that were growing when the Aeliads reigned. This is more of Athelia's subconscious desires taking place. She's not trying to heal and move forward. She wants to go back to the way things were before things were awful. We'll see this motivation as a more conscious directive later. Regardless of the metaphysics, for practical reasons, stopping the wild burn growth and saving Westweald becomes the primary focus of the quest for a while. 
To that end, we are forced to destroy Hope Root, the newly grown Dawnwood settlement, and kill Greenspeaker Sorlin, who had once been a friend of Baragon's. The other downside of this fight is that King Nantharion, leader of the Recollection, escapes with Shard Marshal Vargas. To focus on the positive, we did, yes, get to burn some creepy forest, and if you watched my video showcasing all Gold Road rewards, you know I don't have a lot of love for those demon trees. As long as I've paused, I'll add that if you're enjoying yourself, please feed the algorithm by liking the video or subscribing if you haven't already. I'll never be able to keep to a regular posting schedule, so subscribing and clicking the notification bell is the best way to make sure you see my videos. And now back to the plot. After some post-fight discussion with our allies, we have two equally pressing concerns. Firstly, the documents we found in Hope Root lead Tribune Aaliyah to believe that attack at Feldegard Keep is imminent and we must go to help. And two, Laramil urges us to head to the Outcast Inn as the threads of fate are taking a beating there. I mean, more so even than is usual for this quest. While at Hope Root, we saw a memory of Athelia heading to the Outcast Inn, so let's go there first. But before that, I'm going to return to that minor bit I skipped at Ellenglen. You know, that part where we met Athelia for the first time? Yeah, let's talk about that. Ellen Glen, the Aeliad ruins containing the shrine of a forgotten Daedric prince. THE forgotten Daedric prince, in fact, and one of her primary shrines, so in her confusion she returns to it. But although Athelia is looking for a safe haven filled with devoted worshippers to tend to her metaphysical wounds, in Ellen Glen, our goddess of light finds only dark, empty ruins. We don't get to talk to her long at Ellen Glen, however. She asks us to use Mora's Echonir to reveal a memory, and it shows us the exact moment that Mora told Athelia she needed to be a different person for him to love her, and she reminded him that Daedric princes don't change their spots, and also he could go tentacle himself. I might be paraphrasing. Once that exchange is over, our current day Athelia remembers that she was imprisoned and pieces out to go get a drink. As one would. So when later offered a chance to go to Feldegard Keep with Aaliyah, or to investigate the Outcast Inn, let's first head to the Outcast Inn and buy a lady a drink. Laramil meets us outside the Outcast Inn to explain cause and effect are being decoupled in the local reality. I love Laramil, by the way. To translate, and I'm quoting Dr. Peter Venkman here, that's bad. Dogs and cats living together kind of stuff. And clearly all is not right with the world inside that gate because it appears the air is turning into cracking glass. So sure, let's dive right into that. What could possibly... Nah, I won't even. So we walk right into something no sane person would, as is our want, and then we pause to look up. And here's where I figured it out. And my little mind was blown. First, I realized the sky has too many planets. That is, more than eight, which means they can't be the Adric planets with Oblivion showing behind them. In that case, they have to be representations of the planes of Daedric princes. But if that's true, where is this sky? When standing on the plane of a Daedric prince, you normally see only the essence of that prince around you, no other planes visible. No Daedric plane in Oblivion has a sky with planets in it. Well, no plane except one. And then I remembered where I had seen that sky before. If you are watching this video, you probably already know the big reveal, but I'm going to do a big dramatic cliffhangery pause here like you don't and walk on into the bar without saying more. The story deserves it. Besides, there's a lady at the bar waiting for a drink, and as the saying goes, it's not nice to keep a phenomenally powerful crazy lady waiting near instant bystanders. Paraphrasing again, Natch. Once inside the bar, it continues to be clear that yes, Laramil's correct, things here are obviously not okay. Fortunately, the owner and bartender has some stalwart customers. There are some really nice bits with the owner and bartender. He's a genuinely good guy who so habitually cares for his clientele that he tries to figure out what drink the crazy lady at the fire needs rather than, you know, ordering her and her scary metaphysics the tusk out of his bar. Which is good, given the whole power imbalance thing. I'm not going to be able to include much of him, though, because there's a lot of back and forthing and we need to go chat with Athelia. So... How are you feeling, our Prince of Paths? I don't know if you can understand me. My mind is a storm of images and voices and memories. I can see every reality all at once, the many paths. But my grip on this realm keeps slipping. But you, I see that you are real. 
She struggles to explain that retaining cohesion or control is a losing battle, and while she can't remember or explain the details, she knows there's a drink that will help her and this bar can provide that drink. She also apologizes for the glowing, ghostly shades who keep popping into and out of existence around the bar. She's pulling them in from other paths and can't stop herself. But the drink will help, she repeats. Sage's Dream, it's called. We chat with the bespoke bartender who so badly wants to help, and after a few steps, we're down in the basement getting some substitute ingredients to try and replicate an ancient alien drink, even though the actual ingredients in the recipe are extinct. Suddenly, Athelia joins us in the dirty basement, which, oh, by the way, happens to merge into some ancient alien ruins because that's just how West Weald rolls. And what does Athelia sense buried in the dirt of those ruins? Why, it's Azura's lamp, one of the three Daedric relics sought by Torvisard, the Recollection, the Shardborn, and us. We take it because Athelia doesn't want to touch the thing. When you left, I was compelled to follow. I saw an image of you entering this chamber, and I knew I had to be here with you. But then this awful lamp appeared, rudely popping out of nowhere. I hate the damned thing! Could you pick it up? I wished to examine it, but could not stand holding the horrid thing. Which seems fair, given that it was created to catch and imprison her. So we take the lamp, and then things get super interesting. We get to walk the many paths with a goddess. One by one, the lamp reveals places in the basement where the many paths can be accessed, and we step through the shining portals with our new BFF, Athelia, because why wouldn't we? The first portal goes to the same where, but a different when, now right before Athelia's imprisonment, on a path where she surrendered. That is the nature of the many paths. They can carry you to new possibilities, new realities, but... The rest eludes me. I think this is the first time we've ever seen an alien ruin before it was a ruin, and I'm struck by how beautiful and comfortable it feels with the addition of the plant's light and the green glass window. This is a gorgeous living space. It feels so majestic and far warmer than I would have expected. Alien ruins have always felt so stark and cold and, well, dead. The difference is really something. But as beautiful as the room is, we've got a date with an angel. She's less crazy in this when, but it's probably still not a good idea to keep her waiting. Indeed, our razor-edged angel has more information than patience, but she does share quite a bit, including the fact that she is surrendering because she has come to believe that Mora is correct, and she hopes being imprisoned will give her time to figure out how to prevent the disastrous future they both believe will happen if she remains free. The Prince of Fate foresees a cataclysm approaching. He feels he must imprison me. And I agree. Do not fear, mortal. I have a plan. My scions will one day set me free, after I have had sufficient time to figure out how to avert the disaster Mora predicts. Razor Angel Athelia also tells us the more relevant info that our Athelia's damage has come from being separated so long from the many paths, and therefore the other Athelias. She says that for our Athelia to be able to control her power and stop endangering our reality, she needs to reintegrate. The drink our Athelia has been requesting, Sage's Dream, is actually a spell manifesting as a drink. It was created to help Athelia's heal when one becomes separated from the paths. The ingredients each grow in the shadows of different Athelias on different paths. Collecting each ingredient and combining them infuses the essence of those different Athelias into the spell. When our Athelia drinks this mixed drink, she will absorb the combined power and will be able to reconnect to the paths and heal. Yes, our Razor Angel explains, there's Tyramweed right over there. And no, she does not care to share where she bought her outfit. I asked several times. My patience with you has reached its end, Pathwalker. Once we portal back, our Athelia notably comments that she doesn't remember surrendering like that. No, in her reality, it was a battle and it was epic. Then the lamp has a new portal to show us, which leads, again, to the same where, but a different when. On this new path, instead of a relatively graceful surrender, the Athelia here has chosen despair. And like everyone who has succumbed to despair, she is not happy to see visitors. I see my loyal soldiers line the halls, but despair fills the air. We are not welcome here. Tread carefully as you search for the ingredient we need. No, you do not belong here. 
but a reflection of the Prince of Paths travels with you. Have you come to revel at my defeat? To watch Hermaeus Mora imprison me? Honest, I really haven't. I just want a plant so I can help the other Athelia beside me. My Shardborn should gut you. Whether you intend it or not, this humiliates me even more. An item of my ruin borne by a reflection who walks free. If it will get you to leave, I have hark fruit, one of the ingredients for Sage's dream. Take it and go. Great, thanks. Hey, before I go, can you tell me who does your hair? Fine. That's two ingredients down. Our helpful lamp now shows us a third portal location, and absolutely none of the Athelias trust that that lamp is helping because it's their friend. Mora's forces breached the shrine on this path. These Shardborn battle for their very existence, and the Athelia of this realm's anger fills the air. On the third path, we find Torvasard, and he comes to a conclusion about the lamp's motivations. Oh, I understand. Azura's lamp wants to preserve your reality. By helping your Athelia regain control, she can be safely imprisoned again. This path's Torvasard also explains that his Athelia has utterly gone off the deep end and has become the monster that Mora said she could be. If you've been wondering if Mora was making it up for jealousy or greed or control or whatever, this proves the answer is no, at least not entirely. There's also an argument to be made here that she never would have ended up at this point if Mora hadn't pushed her. So is it fate or is it choice? This is the fulcrum of the quest. As Torvasard speaks, in the background we can see Athelia rising into the air and glowing more and more red. This definitely is a worst case scenario to be avoided at all costs, and I made the decision right then that if I had the opportunity to try a compassionate approach, I would take it. Mora Dennis! Damn his eyes! Every one of them! He wanted a monster! Behold the last tomorrow! Behold the destroyer of reality! But Torv's right about this one being past the point of no return, so we're going to grab our loot berries and jump home. Hey, before I go, is your tattoo artist a local guy, or do I have to go to the city to get that glowing ink? If you have the ingredient we came for, then we need to go. Now. So that's no to local? When we get back to the third ingredient, there's a mini-game to properly mix the drink, and then we take it upstairs to where Athelia has returned, asking ourselves along the way if there's going to be a comfortable, happy option to end this quest line, or if five minutes after healing our new friend, we're really going to throw her back into her forever jail to go crazy again. But first we have to do the healing, so we hand over the drink that is not a drink, and sure enough, a moment later, Athelia's consciousness snaps back into focus, and she remembers. Oh, finally. The storm abates, and I can clearly see the many paths. I can discern one reality from the next, and my mind is clear. I am myself again. I am Athelia, prince of paths and mistress of the untraveled road. And then, naturally, she pieces out again before we decide we need to not waste our chance and throw down with her right there. Can't say I blame her, but before she left, she could have at least told me if the cowl is connected to the shirt or if she had to pay extra for that. However, before Athelia leaves, she does send the glowing shades back to their respective paths, and when we step outside, the sky is once again Nern's sky. Laramil is pleased and gives us a reward on Moore's behalf, even though we just powered up the prisoner before losing her again, which doesn't seem reward worthy, but I'll cash the check. Then we head off to help Tribunalia repel Daedric forces at Feldegard Keep so they can't use the keep to move against Skingrad. This quest becomes a moving battle through the fort as we help repel Daedra while chasing Shard Marshal Vargas until we follow her, like we do, through a portal to anywhere like the little avatars of overconfidence that we are. And as it happens, that portal doesn't go anywhere, but to a very specific where, which is Miramor. This is now our first solid look at the Daedric Plain that used to be Athelia's realm. Except, of course, it isn't our first look. The sky is the sky we saw back at the Outcast Inn. The Oblivion Sky with too many planets. The same sky, in fact, now that we're thinking about it, that we saw back in Athelia's prison. But now we're realizing that wasn't the first time we saw it either, because that skeleton is unmistakable. 
Once upon a time, Athelia was a Daedric prince with all that entails. Legions of awestruck mortal worshippers, shrines, Daedric clans devoted to her service, and a Daedric plain in oblivion she called home, a plain known as Miramore. The plains of Daedric princes are extensions of that prince. Mora imprisoned Athelia, trapping her and cutting her off from her own power. Remember what we learned from the Glyphics in the Necrom quest. A thing forgotten is not a thing that never was. When Athelia was cut off from her power and memory of her faded until no one remembered the source of that power, those cut off parts of her didn't disappear out of existence. They were, however, forced to do something Daedra don't do. They had to change. All Daedra are essentially ideas or thought forms, even the weaker ones. The clans are created by their princes to serve a purpose, and that purpose is their entire existence. Torvisard wandered for eons, tortured by an existence with no purpose, but he was only able to even be cognizant of that loss because Athelia had implanted that compulsion in him before she was imprisoned. That tiny piece of herself eventually pushed him to remember and to act. By the way, putting a piece of themselves into something else is how Daedric artifacts are made. That's why Torvisard told us Azura's lamp has its own sentience and agenda. Athelia did the same thing, except Torvisard was the lamp. The rest of the Shardborn didn't have that deliberately hidden spark of Athelia buried inside of them, however, and when she was removed from memory, they could no longer hold their shape. Some, like Thoat, were transformed. Some clans became attached to other Daedric princes. And a lot of them did another thing Daedra never do. They died. They died en masse. And without her, the plane that had been a part of Athelia's power withered and died as well, becoming a mass grave for her fallen kin. Fargrave, we called it. The Daedric Plain without a prince or a proper history. I have a confession to make. When I watched the Twitch stream for the Fargrave DLC, I was intrigued by the possibilities, but I have to say, I also gave the concept quite a lot of side-eye. Since Daedric Plains are part of Daedric Princes, you really can't have one without the other. So I poured it into Fargrave on the PTS with a certain amount of trepidation in my excitement. Then I stood here at the Way Shrine for a long while thinking, Daedra don't leave skeletons behind. So how is that there? The skeleton instantly telegraphed that something massive and unprecedented had happened, and I remembered that Fargrave was called the Celestial Palanquin. A palanquin is a conveyance, implying two things. One, the bearers of a palanquin are carrying someone. So while Fargrave doesn't have a prince now, it is evident from that name alone that at one point it was under someone's control, and two, palanquins move. This was a plane that someone once used to travel across oblivion. Well, oblivion at a bare minimum. I realized that's probably one of two reasons why other planets were visible in the sky. The celestial palanquin exists uniquely as a plane that can access other realities because that's what someone at some point, built it to do. So those planes are visible because they are possible destinations. And the other reason I could likely see other planes in the sky represented by planets was because there wasn't a prince present whose essence was filling up the sky. So I decided in that moment to have faith in the Fargrave story. It felt clear to me that whatever the place was, it had backstory to spare, and the only question was whether or not I would ever get to learn that backstory. Zoss doesn't know me personally, but they know my demographic, so about a minute in, there's a book by the door that addresses the questions they knew the lore nerds would be asking. It's called The Bearers of Fargrave, and it's a mortal scholar recording some of the stories he's heard about the origin of the giant skeletons and the plane as a whole, including the fact that the skeletons are widely referred to as the bearers of the celestial palanquin. It felt to me like none of the stories in the book were exactly right, but it solidified my faith that there was a story behind the origin of the plane, just not these. Years passed. We explored Fargrave and the Deadlands. We learned a lot about the Longhouse Emperors, which was fascinating. We went to High Isle, we went to Galen. I spent some time following the three Alliance leaders around a forest, wondering why I couldn't just take the Ruby Throne for myself right there, but somehow that was never an option. Then Necrom opened. No wonder the Zoss team were all so excited at the Necrom Chapter livestream to finally get this thing off the ground for real. I'm generally a huge fangirl, but seriously, as a writer, a storyteller, a gamer, and a fan, this Fargrave Mirror More reveal is a top gaming moment for me. I'm glad I'm able to, first, publicly apologize for my lack of faith back there in the beginning, and secondly, 
say a big thank you to everyone who was part of making this happen. Really magnificent work. To return to our battle with Shard Marshal Vargas, Vargas leaves Abolisher behind, and now we have two of the three Daedric artifacts referenced in the title of the quest. Subsequently, based on a clue from our ally Baragon, we head to the ruins of Neriostere and use Boethia's Abolisher and Azura's Lamp to acquire Mephala's Skein. And now we have all three. After some twists and turns, we're able to follow Athelia to the heart of Miramore, except, oh look, the portal now just says it's straight up. We're going to Fargrave. To finish the summary, I want to give everyone a hug. We follow the path of, through Miramore to a magnificent portal keyed by runes, and after we figure out how to open it, we pop right through that too. Back when we met her on the many paths, Athelia described the catalyst event that led to Mora's decision to remove her this way. I used my ability to manipulate the many paths to prevent one disaster. But now Mora sees my efforts as the predecessor to something even more terrible. The method Athelia used was a tremendous machine she created to make reality more flexible. As with Azura and the Lamp, as with Torvasard, she poured some of herself, her essence and power, into a device. The Loom of the Untraveled Road. After we step through the portal to the Loom, the Echonir shows us a vision of Athelia explaining to Vargas and Torvasard how the Loom functions. I can break the shackles of fate, undo mistakes, unlock possibilities. Create new histories. Athelia can use the loom to change history. That is how she will restore what was lost. It's magnificent. But won't some princes see it as a threat? A threat? This is a gift. The gift of unconstrained choice. The loom will weave a new story for every being. What they choose to be true. All shall benefit. If you have studied Buddhism at all, you may be familiar with the idea that reality is, essentially, a shared illusion we have all agreed to believe in. What Athelia is proposing means each person on Nern would have their own independent reality. It means dissolving all connections of the shared collective experience with others. The people in your personal little fantasy would never disappoint you, sure, but they'd never surprise you either, since you'd be interacting with figments of your own imagination and not independent souls. Another word we use for that is madness. Athelia calls it a loom, but it is actually an unweaving machine. Think of reality as an interwoven, self-supporting tapestry of shared events, each person's fate a thread interwoven with countless others. Athelia's loom turns that self-supporting, ordered structure into a tangled mass of unconnected strings, which is, to again quote Dr. Venkman, bad. Breaks my heart to say, but it appears Mora and Mankar Kamorn were right about that whole destroy reality assessment of the Magna Gi, or at least its prime archon. A whole future that will never happen flashes before my eyes. Athelia and I will never get to sit up past midnight, making beaded arm jewelry, drinking alien wine, and examining the fascinating interplay of fate, chance, and choice. I'm sad about that, but I'm still going to have to step forward and smash that loom, even though I am 100% sure that is also a very bad idea. The Unweaver! I am filled with the power of the many parts! Come, Torvisard, away! And here we are, right at the worst-case scenario we were trying to avoid from the start. It's like it was fate. After going DEFCON WTF, Athelia leaves, but I won't say she pieces out this time. We then enact the most heroic response to a perfectly predictable emergency that I have ever been proud to be a part of. That is, we portal home and hope for the best. With the loom destroyed, Athelia is no longer able to destroy reality with it. However, she reabsorbed all the power she poured into the loom when creating it, and now is capital P pissed besides. You know, in that reality ending way we saw her do? Yeah, bad. But my allies seem very pleased about the outcome and are offering me rewards and talking about healing Westweald's animosities. I go to bed chewing my lip. 
If you have not done the Necrom Zone story, then the plot ends here, and I was surprised by how hard the cliffhanger was. I'd be bummed if I hadn't done Necrom and this was the end of the story. But we have, and it isn't, and pretty soon we are contacted by our allies who have come up with an idea. There's some back and forthing here, but the gist of the plan is this. We exhausted the power of the three Daedric artifacts during the previous encounter with Athelia, but we are able to recharge each of them. Once we finish that, Laramil performs a ritual to transfer their collective energy into a new Daedric artifact Laramil calls the Mirror of Truth. The power behind the Mirror of Truth lies in the tension between being a true to your nature and being able to choose your own path. Athelia and the others have said that she is unable to refrain from destruction because being true to her nature leads only to that end. We cannot change who we are, but mortals... You choose your paths. I envy this. But it is also true that when we traveled the many paths with our Athelia, we saw several versions of her which differed because of their choices. They were each truly Athelia, and we know that because their essences distilled through the plants and the drink were able to bring our Athelia back to herself. Yet despite each of them being true, they were different due to their choices meaning that our Athelia does have the power to choose her response to this situation. Some of the most powerful magic in Elder Scrolls is based on perspective and choice. It is the nature of a mirror to reflect yourself back to you, and it was the nature of the three artifacts we used to create it to stop Athelia from destroying reality. Unfortunately, we do have to pay a high price to recharge those artifacts and reach Athelia. That's a plot point I will come back to. However, we are eventually able to confront Athelia with the mirror in hand and to use it after we have weakened her in combat. Athelia looks into the mirror of truth as we hold it before her and she sees, truly sees, that while she is angry at Mora for calling her a monster, it is indeed a monster looking back at her from within that mirror. That mirror, it showed me the truth. I have become the monster that Mora predicted. And I remember. I saw it, too. As Mora sealed my prison all those eons ago, I realized at the end... He was right. I am the last tomorrow. It was what Mora saw when he examined my threads of fate, that I would become the Unweaver, the destroyer of reality. In that last moment, as the door to my prison slammed shut and my memories frayed, <laughs> I saw it too, but it was too late. I think it's important to note that Athelia doesn't seem to want to destroy reality. And it seems like if Mankar Kamoran was right about the Magna Ghi, that would come across more clearly as a goal. Instead, she's been pretty consistently compassionate where possible, and seems upset to realize that Mora is right about her monstrous potential. Even now, while saying she doesn't know a way to fix the problem, she still, somewhat miraculously, keeps reins on her rage. If she can just keep doing that for a few more minutes, we might all get through this. I must shed this power once and for all. Only then can the growing madness be quelled. Unfortunately, this is the moment that Torvisard snaps. He's been through too much, fought too hard to see her give up now. We saw a glimpse of that back on the many paths, his frustration when his Athelia surrendered. And that was before he spent millennia wandering alone, being tortured by a dream. So when our Athelia calms down and gives in, T loses it. Ultimately, however, it isn't our attacks that end him, but Athelia herself taking pity on his existence, which has become unbearable. This moment reminds me of the Indrix quest in Scribing. Athelia gave a whisper for power to a being who did not ask for it and ultimately suffered extensively because of that. But let's give Torvisard his due as Athelia gently unmakes him. I created my scions to save me from a fate I finally accepted, though I had forgotten until you reminded me. No, my prince. I am Dramora. I am eternal. I will reform and complete the task you set before me. Such is the nature of Daedra. Never changing, never growing. I return your power to you, Mora. And I disperse mine into the void. 
and Torfasad, my most faithful. I consign your essence to nothingness, never to return. Be at peace, at last. Poor Torvisard, blinded by a compulsion I never should have bestowed. Athelia can't hold herself together forever, however. She's coherent enough to agree that to save reality, she needs to be returned to Mora's prison, says that the madness and power are clawing to get back in, and we don't have much time to act. Your prison awaits, Ethelia. So Mora steps in to escort her back to Forever Jail, and I'm settling in to be really upset at the dialogue options I'm about to be given when another miracle happens, and I'm allowed a chance to think of a sideways solution. Sideways solutions are my forte, so this is especially delightful. Our natures confound us. We need a different perspective. Mortal, let us speak. Mortal, talk with me more about change. The real issue here is that Athelia has the power to unmake reality. But what if she didn't? Her power will always return to her if it is stripped away or rejected, but the many paths lead to here, there, and elsewhere, yes? So what if she went elsewhere, to a place where her Daedric power could not follow, a place where magic didn't exist? What if we then destroyed that path behind her? Both Mora and Athelia agree to this plan. What say you, Prince of Paths? Will you accept eternal banishment in a realm? where your power does not exist. I accept that fate, Hermaeus Mora. Then allow me to turn my gaze upon the many paths to find a worthy reality. And allow me to show you how to open that path, while I still have the will to do so. A portal opens on the many paths. None of us know where it leads, only that she cannot return from it. Now, you have shown we who are called Daedric Princes that there are always possibilities, even for us. (laughs) Farewell, mortal. Athelia leaves her power behind her and steps through without looking back. We then destroy the portal, removing her ability to return. And the Prince of Paths is no more. So what happens now? Where does Athelia's power go if it can't get to her? We saw her give a bunch of it to Hermaeus Mora, we know he isn't giving that up. As for the remainder, some of it will go to her Daedra, and maybe that will enable them to last indefinitely without her. I am glad we get to keep the mosaics however I feel for them, remembering Miramore, but not their prince. It also seems possible the Orbis will fill the vacuum by eventually coalescing the power into a new Athelia. Or it might drag an Athelia away from a damaged path to replace ours. Or, maybe the power will go to the other Magna Key. If some of them went dormant somehow when Athelia was imprisoned, that might revive them. So many fantastic possibilities when looking at the many paths. I can see how Athelia was loath to pick just one. But there's a quest epilogue we still need to discuss before I wrap up. Baragon, our wood elf friend who lives in a house made out of a lot of beautifully cut timber, has thrown us a party on his balcony to celebrate that whole saving reality thing we did. I had high hopes he'd give us the townhouse as a reward, but sadly that is not the case. I'm still hoping that between his green speaker friend giving him shit about the number of trees who died to make that home and his newly awakened urge to go exploring, that he will decide in a future patch to gift us the keys to this townhouse. In the meantime, we're still at a party. When all of the sudden, Mora summons us to oblivion. Scrooge hopes it isn't to destroy us utterly, but places no bets. I find that a little infuriating, as Mora owes me pretty big, but I put on my pleasant smile and obey the rudely imperious summons. Mora rewards us, and along the way explains that yes, he absolutely is going to erase everyone's memories again, but since we were helpful, we get to keep ours. Thanks? I suspect keeping our memories has more to do with that contract where we were oath-bound to help him and he was oath-bound to not harm us during or for performing the help, but I won't press the point. Mora has some other things to say, but in my opinion, the highlight of the exchange involves Laramil. 
During our battles to save reality, we unfortunately lost Curate Gadain to an attack by Vargas, and Laramil had become very fond of him, as you may be aware. His exact fate, death or being lost on the many paths, was not exactly clear, but despite her heartbreaking, Laramil did everything she needed to do to get us through the quest. Right before Athelia stepped through that final portal, however, Laramil begged her for a reason to have hope. Now, Wait! We lost a good friend to one of the reality tears. Is there anything that... The tears were not my creation, only an effect of my passing. All I can offer is this wisdom to ease your mind. Overwhelmed by that flash look at the many paths, Laramil primarily latched onto the fact that Agadane existed somewhere. Standing here now, with Mora handing out rewards, Laramil asks him for the only thing she really wants, Gadane. My friends, I have a very bad feeling about this. Dr. Venkman kind of bad. We are crossing the streams. This is not going to end well. I mean, I'm not even sure I believe Mora can reach across the many paths, grab the correct Gadane, and bring him back. Not to mention the dozens of potential side effects, including psychological trauma, metaphysical contamination, or the usual problems inherent in altering a timeline. On top of all that, Morris says that if he does so, Laramil will owe him big time, which I again find infuriating. But it is on brand. Because mortal beings are prone to short-term thinking, Laramil agrees to sign this blank check, and we return to Baragon's balcony with a dazed and relieved Gadane in tow. Possibly even ours. What could possibly go? You know, actually, I'm going to make a prediction. I don't know if Athelia returns for next year's chapter story, but I am going to guess that Gadane's involved. I don't think he's supposed to be here, and it's going to be a problem, as is Laramil's ill-advised, open-ended agreement with Mora. And, as long as I'm making predictions, I am going to also guess we will be seeing more of the Magna Gi, Athelia or no. We have now met two of the nine, and some of the others have tantalizing details to explore. I think there's more here to dive into. But wow, is that enough for now, I think. I still have more videos to do in this series because we need to finish discussing the recollection, and yes, I am aware I sidestepped talking about the three good Daedra for another video, but I won't do so forever. I always say thank you for watching, and I always mean it, but that's especially true today. Thank you for watching. As is probably obvious, Elder Scrolls lore is near to my heart, and I do love making lore videos. But so far, they haven't performed well on the channel, and with so much great content to cover, it's hard to justify doing a lot of lore vids if that isn't what people want to watch. So I decided to put my back into this series and see if I could get traction on it, because I know the audience is out there. And after I finish this series, I'll make a decision about lore content going forward. So as you have been told by, like, every YouTuber ever, if this is the kind of content you enjoy, I'd love your support for it. Give it a like or comment, sure, but the best way to spread the word is to send the link to a lore-loving friend or post the link on social media with the hashtag ESO and hashtag lore and tag Zoss at The Elder Scrolls Online. Those tags have the best chance of getting the video in front of other lore fans who will enjoy it. But promoting this channel is not your job, and I appreciate that you spent this time hanging out with me, so thank you for that all by itself. I wish you happy hunting in Westfield, and until next time, may all your loots be leet.